by faith, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, Abraham obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. This statement made by the author of Hebrews is one of many in Scripture that without the proper context of Abraham's life would just have very little meaning to us today. He didn't know where he was going. What's that all about? Today, we continue in the second week of a four-part message series called The Patriarch. And during our time together, we're looking at the mysteries and revelations of the life of the first father of our faith, Abraham, a man chosen by God. Before we get in, I want to review a couple of reasons why I want to talk about Abraham in this series and why I believe we have so much to learn from him today. So let's, let's look at these uh, reasons for the Patriarch series again. The first is impact. Now, whether you came in here this morning because you do believe in God or you don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants their life to count for more than just clocking in and clocking out. You may not be sure about the whole God thing, but you want your life to count. You want to have impact. You want to have influence. You want a legacy that's going to continue on long after you're gone. You don't want people forgetting you about you, you know, the week after the funeral. Everybody wants impact. And here we gather to talk about a man who lived 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago. And it's not just us talking about him. Over half of the 6 billion people, I mean, every time I think about that, every time I think about that, it just is overwhelming to me. Over half of the 6 billion people alive today are either biological or spiritual descendants of Abraham. You want impact? Start with Abraham. The second is illumination. If you came in with your Bible and you've read your Bible, you have come across Abraham multiple times in Scripture. I'm sure of it. Because the whole Bible is filled with stories about Abraham. And without understanding his life, you can't understand what's being said later in the story. Right? Does that make sense? I was teaching a class um, a couple years ago, and somebody came up to me afterwards and they said, uh, you're kind of an Old Testament guy. I didn't know what they meant, and, but then they went on and explained that, well, I'm a New Testament person. I'm kind of a New Testament person. And so I just think it's neat that you're kind of an Old Testament guy. I'm a New Testament person. I didn't realize you could separate the two. You know, I mean, they're all in the same thing. Here's the deal. Here's the reality. Jesus did not come to start a new religion. He came, as the Apostle Paul says, to graft us in to the family, to the tree, to draw our life from the root that was planted, the tree that was planted with Abraham. This guy is a big deal. The third reason, implications. If we've been grafted into that tree, then we should expect our behavior, the way we think, a, a, a recoding of our spiritual DNA to happen. Our behavior will change over time as we grow into that tree. Simply put, there's implications to being part of the family. Now, if you weren't here last week, I want to do a very quick review. I'd really like you to go watch it just so you'd have even more of the context for what we're going to talk about today. But if you weren't here last week, let me just let me sum it up for you, okay? After all the talk and everything we said, this is what we came down to. God chose Abraham to be a father specifically because Abraham himself chose to be a father before he ever was. And you say, well, what's that all about? Well, we're looking at the, we were looking at the mystery of why did God chose Abraham, and God chose Abraham to be a father. But not just a father. And this is the part that, I mean, is just still mind-blowing to me, even after having thought about this for a while. And, and I would imagine that if God was to come to Abraham, they would have this conversation about what kind of father he was going to be. Right? What kind of father? Abraham, I'm not calling you just be a father. Or the world needs good fathers. I'm not calling you just be a father. I'm calling you to be the father to my son. But, but not just that. Not just that. Think about this. God is calling Abraham not just to be a father to his son, but he's calling Abraham who took personal responsibility, relational responsibility, communal responsibility, where others did not, 
God's calling Abraham to direct his children, who will direct their children, who will direct their children for generations and generations and generations. Abraham, look, I want you to be a father of my son. In 2,000 years, I'm going to send my son, not as an almighty God, but as a tiny little infant baby who doesn't know anything. And I want you to have directed your children in such a way, and theirs after theirs, all the way down, that my son will grow up in favor with God, in favor with man, and that one day he's going to save you. That's the kind of responsibility I'm putting on you, Abraham. And Abraham was willing to stand up to that challenge. That is incredible to me. But it's about this time that it really sinks in, the significance of God calling Abraham to be a father, that we recall the first words God said to Abraham. The very first words. Leave your land, your birthplace, and your father's house, and go to a land I will show you. We understand God's calling to be a father. We understand the significance. But does that seem a little bit odd to anyone else? The first thing of, that God's calling this ultimate family man is to leave his own family? Does that not seem a little bit counter to you know, his calling of being this family man? But it's not just that. Because as we go down to the story of Abraham... You know, and he actually leaves. He's, he's off on his way. God has promised him a son, and yet a son's not coming. His wife are, are frustrated. They've been struggling with infertility for a really long time. Abraham's 75 years old plus at this time. I don't know how old they were when they got married, but it's safe to say they've been struggling with infertility for about 45 years or more. And those of you who struggle with that, you know the pain and the heartache of that, and they were feeling that heartache, going, God, you, we left because, you know, you said this, you know, and then it just dawns on Abraham's wife, you know what, maybe you should take my handmaid and then y'all could have a kid. Maybe that's what God meant. And whatever you think of Ishmael, whatever your thoughts are on Ishmael, they have this son named Ishmael, and he's not the one, and God says, I want you to send Ishmael, your son, I want you to send him away. It doesn't look like he's coming back. I want you to send him away. And then they have another son. Uh, excuse me, Abraham and Sarah end up having a son, right? And they have a son named Isaac. And it's not long before God says, hey, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice him. Okay, here's my point. God calls Abraham to be a father, right? Everybody's not. Okay, God calls Abraham to be a father. And then he tells him to do this. Leave your family. Send your son away, and sacrifice the other one. Doesn't that seem kind of anti-fatherly? And so that's the mystery. Last week is why did God choose Abraham? We understand. It wasn't explicit in the text initially, and neither is this week. But here's this week's mystery, okay? Why did God call Abraham to do three anti-fatherly tasks? Now, that's a lot to take in, in in one week. I mean, that's, a, that's big. You're kind of like, what? I haven't thought about that. What, what is the deal with God calling Abraham to do something that seems counter to what he called him to? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to split up the next two weeks, okay? We've got next week is going to be why did God send, tell Abraham to send one son away and sacrifice the other? And then this week, we're going to focus on this question. Why did Abraham have to leave and go? Why did Abraham have to leave and go? Because in that, there are two commands. There is the leaving and the going. Right? I want you to leave. What, what was he said to him to give? I want you to leave your land, your birthplace, and your father's house. I want you to give up. What does that mean? Leave your land, your, your birthplace, and your father's house. What is he giving up? I want you to leave your status. I want you to leave your comfort. I want you to leave your protection. I want you to leave everything that you draw your identity from. I want you to leave all of that. It doesn't look like what God's saying is, hey, Abraham, I want you to go on a little vacation for a little bit. 
Okay, you're going to go over here for spend some time there, and then you'll be able to come back to all this. No, what he's saying is you're giving all of this up. This is a defining moment. If you've seen the Matrix, Matrix this is a, a red pill or blue pill moment, right? If you take this pill, you'll wake up tomorrow, and you're going to enjoy, you know, spending the rest of the time with your family and your land, your birthplace, everybody knows you, you feel good. You're going to spend the rest of your life enjoying all of that. But if you take this pill... Tomorrow, you're going to wake up, and you're going to pack everything. And you're going to be trying to explain to your father, look, I, yeah, God said if I go there, he's going to bless me. And, and so I think I'm going to go. And his father's like, where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. Um, you know, well, what are you going to do when you get there? I don't really know. If you're a parent and your child came and told you that, you'd be like, wait a minute, sit down. before you, Okay, <laughs> hold the camels. We're going to talk about this before you get going, all right? But yet... He goes. And so I want to interrogate this a little bit, okay? I want, to, I want to peel this apart. Could God not have blessed him where he was? The idea is absurd. Of course God could have blessed him where he was. He's God. We're talking about God here. Was the new land that he's going to just that much better than where he was? Abraham takes along his nephew with him, and they're off on their way. And if you remember the description of the land, or at least a part of the land, that Lot um, describes, he says that the land looked like the garden of God. So clearly this land is really great. And even later in the next book, we're in Genesis, look at the next book. God describes the land to Abraham's children as being a land flowing with milk and honey. And you're like, wow, yeah, sounds like it's got a lot of really good resources. That's great. I think the point is even more. This, is, this land is good for the farmers, and it's good for the shepherds both. Cain and Abel, a farmer and a shepherd fighting. This land is going to be a land where they can coexist. So clearly the land is really, I mean, it's a really big deal. But is it that big a deal to Abraham? Is it one of those situations where, like, hey, Abraham, trust me, when you get there, you won't even remember your family. <laughs> you won't even remember your birthplace. It's going to be so good. You won't even remember all that. Abraham's giving up a lot here. And any time that we see a movie or a story or any, you know, narrative playing out where we've got this hero who's, you know, giving up a lot of, uh, you know, making a lot of personal sacrifices, we, we have to ask this question. Is this somehow just for the greater good? You know, is this a, a Frodo and the, the ring? I'm sorry, Frodo, the next several years are going to be terrible. You're going to risk your life. You're going to risk your friend's life and your whole, your whole family. You're going to risk a lot of people's lives. And you know what? Uh, my ways are higher than your ways, uh, but this is just for the greater good. I'm sorry, you're, you're just the one that this task has fallen on. We struggle with that idea of the greater good because nobody really wants to be called into a situation that's not really personally good. You know, it's for the greater good, and you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll do it. Or is this just a big trust fall moment? Is this just a moment where God's saying, look, I'm going to give you, I'm, it's going to be great, but you got to trust me, and that's, that's what it's all about. You just got to fall back and get rid of everything, sacrifice everything, and you just, you just fall back, and you gotta, you got to trust me. I do believe that trust is a part of it. I do believe that the land is so good, an image of maybe what's to come. But is that what it's all about? I want to break down this even further, okay? Because Abraham's response is shockingly fast. It says God, you know, God calls him to do this, and, and it, all it says is, so Abraham went as the Lord told him. No argument, no fuss, no questions even, you know, where am I, where am I going, why am I going, What's, what am I going to do when I get there? No words at all. Abraham doesn't say a word. He seems pretty motivated to go. And so we need to break this down. The first question is, why did Abraham want to go? 
And while that's not explicit in the text, I do believe that the answer is right there. It's obedience, right? And you nod your head, yeah, obedience. Abraham's obedient. We're supposed to be obedient. But God makes in this promise. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And he goes on and on, and he gives him this incentive that is, if you go, this will happen. And as he, you know, breaks out just how great it's going to be, and all this blessing goes on and on, Abraham's like, yeah, I want some of that. So clearly there is the power of incentive right there. And I want to pause and talk about incentives. One of my first jobs, my first job, right out of college, I got an offer letter and was like, whoa, I have arrived. This is good. I'm making more money, you know, than in one year than I've made in all of my, this is just for one year, right? And then, you know, and then it was, if you do this, then you'll also get this, a performance incentive. And I was excited, and I paid the price for that performance incentive. Have you ever had that? You know, hey, if you do this, and then you, you'll get this performance, and then you're working, and you're like, wow, this is a lot, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I'm not getting the better end of the deal. You're getting the better end of the deal here. And, and you know, you parents especially, you know the power of incentives. You use it with your kids every single day. Yeah, yesterday was the first full day that my son was two years old. The first full day. And it was like yesterday afternoon. It just like clicked on him. He's like, wait a minute, two, two. What am I, how am I supposed to be acting? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm supposed to make your lives harder. That, it was like a conscious thought. I could see on his face. I was like, no, no, wait. <laughs> and so what we do with our kids, right, is we say, if you do this, then you'll get this. If you don't do this, you won't get this. Right? You probably learned this in psychology. It's grandma's rule. First, you've got to eat your carrots before you get your dessert. Right? If you do this, then you'll get this. If you don't do this, you won't get, do, you won't get this. And if you keep doing this, then you're going to get something else that you don't want. <laughs> right? That's the way it goes. And so this is the point I'm trying to make with that. Incentives are very important. Okay? Anytime someone is offering you an incentive, you've got to ask the question, what is this going to do for me? And what are you going to get from me? You with me? You've got to ask that question. And I'm, I'm not saying that you, need to, you necessarily need to question God, but I think that's an, a very important thing to see as this is playing out, is why did Abraham want to go? He was getting a very powerful incentive. That was a strong, motivating factor. So then the question is, is why did God want Abraham to go? Why did God want Abraham to go? And we already know that Abraham's going to start the family, that Jesus Christ is going to be born into, and he's going to save Abraham, save the whole world, and clearly that's, you know, that's where this is going. This is really important. But why did God want Abraham to go? What did he want from him, and what did he want for him? I am not a Hebrew scholar. I just want to go ahead and say that right up front, because I don't want you thinking, walking out of here, man, that guy's smart. I am not. So I, I don't want you thinking I'm any smarter than I am. And yet, I love nuances in Scripture that illuminate what the text is actually guiding us to. Now, I, I believe that our translation is perfectly good enough. It gives us everything we need to know about God and about ourselves and the relationship between. And yet, it was not written in English. It was written in a language many, many years ago. And so I want to point out a little nuance in the scripture that I've learned that I think is going to be beneficial for you. And it's in the word go. The words are lekleka. Say lekleka. Lekleka. The words have, have a hard time translating in English. It's kind of ambiguous. The interpretation of it is ambiguous. And you're like, oh man, I just wish I could read my Bible and just you know, know exactly 
you know, what, what it's saying, when it's saying, and go is perfectly good. And yet, I believe in there are, are invitations to something even greater than what we see explicitly in the text. So today, I want to talk to you about four invitations that I have found contained in the words lek leka. And the importance they were to Abraham's call and the importance it is for your own calling as well. You with me? Four invitations. Let's look at these, uh, let's look at these invitations. The first is translated as go for yourself. Go for yourself. What does that, what does that mean? There's a rabbi uh, who said, Abraham, go for yourself to the land that I will show you. And what he meant was this. Journey for yourself. Travel for your own benefit and good. There I will make you into a great nation. Here you will not have the merit of having children. Go for yourself, for your own benefit. And we know, all of us who've left our parents' house, we've left, you know, jobs and left, you know, a lot of stuff behind, know that as you continue on in the journey, you benefit from a lot of difficult circumstances. And so what God was inviting Abraham to was not something from him, but go for yourself. Go for your own benefit. This is going to be good for you. Is it going to be easy? No. No, it's not. In fact, you're going to go with your wife, and one of the first things that's going to happen is there's going to be a famine in the land, and you're going to go down looking for food, and people are going to try to kill you because of how beautiful your 65-year-old wife is. And that's not going to happen one time, but multiple times. Go for yourself. It's going to be hard, but go for yourself for your own benefit, for your own good. The second is go with yourself. And you English teachers in here are like, that doesn't even make sense. Go with yourself. What does that mean? Go with yourself. You have to remember, Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. He had already lived a life. God called him because he knew the kind of man that he was. Another rabbi describes it this way. He says, when the Holy One said to Abraham, leave your land, your birthplace, and your father's house, what did Abraham resemble? A jar of scent with a tight-fitting lid put away in a corner so that its fragrance could not go forth. As soon, it was, as soon as it was moved from that place and opened, its fragrance began to spread. So the Holy One said to Abraham, Abraham, many good deeds are in you. Travel about from place to place so that the greatness of your name will go forth in my world. I think that's a beautiful language and a beautiful imagery of what Abraham was going to be. The chapter before Abraham was born, or excuse me, was chosen, the chapter before Abraham was chosen is this story of the Tower of Babel. And what were they trying to do? They were trying to make a name for themselves and build themselves up. And here, God is actually saying, your name is going to be good. I'm going to build the name up. I'm going to build your name up so that as you go throughout the world, you're going to spread the good news about me, to everyone. Years and years later, we see Abraham's children falling into exile, and you have a hard time even understanding why, why they're in exile. I thought you wanted good stuff for them. Why, why are they being you know, taken captive here and there? But when you have this image of go with yourself, take, take your belief system, take your values to the rest of the world, then even exile is looked at as a way of spreading God's name. And there's going to be times in your life where you, you know, I, why am I here? You know God is taking you there to share your belief system, to share your values, to share the truth about God. Go with yourself. Go for yourself. Go with yourself. And yet we know it's not easy. A third invitation that God is encouraging Abraham to go, not just because of the incentive, but to go, is to go by yourself. When you go by yourself, you learn a lot. How many of you have ever had a, a lonely time in your life? Raise your hand. Look at, look at how many people, almost everybody, 
And you, you haven't just had one, you've had multiple. Some of you raising your hands twice. And when you come through on the other side, you've learned a lot about yourself, you've learned a lot about God, and knowing that He is there the whole time and He never left you, and you never were alone. But Abraham, go by yourself. This is not going to be easy. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs puts it this way. He says, only a person who's willing to stand alone, singular and unique, can worship the God who is alone, singular and unique. Only one who is able to leave behind the natural sources of identity, home, family, culture, and society, can encounter God who stands above and beyond nature. I love that. This is a strong encouragement. Abraham, go by yourself. This is not going to be easy. And we learn that even more after Jesus Christ. As we follow him, there's going to be times that we are feeling very alone. But it's in that encouragement, it's in that invitation that we learn about being different. We learn about God to the point that we can even sing these words with our whole heart. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Finally, there's a fourth invitation in this, and it's to go to yourself. This is kind of a mystic interpretation of what God is calling him to. And it looks like this. It's a journey to the root of the soul. You say, what is that? That sounds too, you know, really mystical and, you know, kind of cloudy. I don't understand what that means. But even Jesus described the journey to a land where the kingdom of God is, is, is coming together, where earth and heaven meet like this. He says, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. This is an invitation into inside yourself where God has reached in and touched you from the very beginning and made you spiritual, made him one made you one who is a child of God inside all of us. It's an invitation. Go for yourself. Go with yourself. Go by yourself. And go to yourself. So why did God call Abraham to leave and go? And as we understand and unravel the invitation which God is calling us to, understand that what it is for is not whether God could have blessed Abraham where he was, but could Abraham have received it? That's, that is the power of what God is calling Abraham to. He could not have received it where he was, and neither can you. It is the journey itself, moving from where you are now to where God is calling you to be, that is the slow alignment of your will into his. That's the true blessing. That's the true peace of going and leaving behind so much. It's not about the sacrifice. It is about what you receive. And what you receive is not something tangible, but the alignment of your will into God's to the point that Abraham's children, all the way up until Jesus, up until the point where Jesus is able, the night before he's crucified, to say, not my will, but yours be done. That's the power of the call. And so I ask, what's holding you back? What is your land? What is your birthplace? What is your father's house that's holding you back from moving forward? It's certainly not the incentive. God's promised us blessing. What I believe is holding you back is, I'm not really sure you want your will to be aligned with God's. I know that's true of me. I'm not really sure that I want my will to be aligned with God's because I really like my will. I believe you like yours as well. And yet the promise, the true blessing, is having your will aligned with God's. And thank goodness for Jesus Christ who allowed his will to be aligned, aligned with God's as well. 
I know that still leaves some tension about, uh, about sending one son away and sacrificing another. How does God call Abraham to do these anti-fatherly things? We'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, I want to understand you better. I thank you for the Bible. I thank you that we can open up and read it. And I thank you for people far wiser uh, than us who have poured in and gone into the depths of the Scripture to pull out understanding from it. I thank you that we have that right at our fingertips because sometimes it's just really confusing. Sometimes I just don't understand what you're asking me to do, and sometimes it just it hurts to have my will being altered in such a way that it aligns with yours. I know that's true of others as well, and I pray that over time you'll make it very clear. I thank you for your blessing, Jesus Christ. It's in his son's name. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.